warm period ice ages, and carbon dioxide levels, the red line. You know, there, there looks to be a correlation there. But what you see, what Al Gore did in his presentation, if you look at the red line going straight up, the, the lower dot is where carbon levels were at the time of his presentation. Okay, knowing that levels over the last 600,000 years had never achieved even that high level. But then he dramatically used a scissor lift to show you where carbon dioxide levels would be in 50 years. So now we're down to 40 years from now if our behavior does not change. So if you look at carbon dioxide levels and you can start thinking about what might happen to temperature. Next slide. To bring you up to date, here's where temperatures are going right now. This data is from NASA. July of this year was the hottest month in recorded history globally. But as Al Gore explained in the, in the video that many of you saw just before the formal start of this event, there is hope. Next slide. I'll just quickly show you a few more indications uh, of progress and hope. Today, in 2015, the United States, and I know you'll get information on India, installed 7,260 megawatts of solar energy compared to just 105 uh, at the time of An Inconvenient Truth. Next slide. However, as we touched on, carbon, levels, carbon dioxide levels have gone over 400 parts per million. Next slide. But there are now a million plug-in electrical cars on the roads, whereas 10 years ago there was almost none. Next slide. But sea level is continuing to rise 40.94 millimeters in the last 10 years. And of course, next slide, Calcutta is one of the most vulnerable cities to climate change. I'd like to just share this as the last slide because this was taken just last month in Calcutta at Science City. And you can see somebody on the left there with his mouth open, gazing in amazement, and that's me, sitting next to Council General Hall and to A.D. Chowdhury from Science City. This is science on a sphere. And why I have, personally have great hope for India rising to the challenges is the firm commitment to science and learning that I see every day that I live in India and the investment made by the government of India in education in these areas is an indication to me of, of that commitment. And since my time, even though this still says 0, 0.00, uh, I think we'll skip the video that was available to give you some more inspiration from Al Gore, but please go to the uh, Climate Reality Project YouTube channel if you're interested in hearing more from, uh, from Mr. Gore. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That, that was uh, quite a reckoning. Uh, may I now request Mr. Partho Bhattacharya Mr. to come and address the conclave. Mr. Bhattacharya has been an advisor and mentor to the conclave and to the chamber for many years. We are really grateful to you, sir, for all that you have done for us. And we would now request you to set the theme for today's conclave in perspective. Mr. Bhattacharya. Dignitaries on the dais, distinguished guests and participants of the dais, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. I am really honored to be once again invited by the BCCNI to be here in this ninth uh, conclave. I must at the outset compliment the chamber for once again hosting the flagship event which they have been hosting very successfully for, for the last nine years. It is the last presentation by Mr. Jonathan on climate change has made it somewhat difficult for a born coal professional like me to talk. It's indeed a challenge. But then I will try to address the issues and try to set the theme of the conference uh, in, a, in a somewhat more balanced perspective. 
we have been having uh, this kind of a conclave every year and I vividly recall the conference that we had last year when the Honorable Minister for Coal and Power was present at that point in time. And what were the issues that were discussed and what were the issues that were flagged as the most important and key issues? First, the huge gap between the demand and supply of power in general. India is a country where 30% of the population don't have access to power. So, I mean, for them, you have to provide power first for them to even understand what climate change means. So, that is one challenge. Second, the per capita consumption of power in the country has just crossed 1,000 units, which is one of the lowest, a third of what China has achieved already, and much lower than the world average. So, there is a need to improve on that front and if we have to develop further. These are the general problems and these problems have been with us for quite some time. It is slightly changing over a period of time but not to the extent that we all desire. So in the context of this last year's program, we talked a lot about the initiatives that were taken on demand side management. The new LED bulbs, the energy efficient white goods, which would, which would actually bring down the demand for power, particularly from the elite sector of the society. And initiatives were being planned and those initiatives were trying to get some sort of momentum. There was a quite a big solar power initiative that was talked about. We were talking about a 100 gigawatt program at that time, which now subsequently stands revised to 175 gigawatt, a very ambitious plan in the next five, six years. So these are the things that are being talked about to make, to address the climate change issues as well. But it was certainly recognized that coal will continue to play a very major role for the immediate foreseeable future, maybe two decades or whatever it is. And in order to address that, a decision was conveyed that the main producer of coal, Coal India Limited, will have to double its production in five years' time from about 500 million tons to a billion tons. As part of the program, as far as the first milestone, if I may put it, Mr. Bhattacharya was handed down a target of 11% growth, an unprecedented kind of growth that Coal India has never achieved any time in the past. That was the target handed over to him, 56 million tons of incremental coal production. The block allot blocks that were allotted and were cancelled as a result of the Supreme Court judgment Fast actions were taken to set, sort that right and as a result quite a large number of blocks were allotted through a process of auction or through administrative allocation to state governments. It was expected, there was no target as such, but it was expected that the blocks would produce in 2015-16, the year that has gone by, somewhere around 94 million tons of coal. And the power stations which were at that time Quite a few power stations were running critical stocks, maybe some of them were uh, super critical stocks. Those have to be made comfortable in terms of coal stocks. One year later, what do we find? We find that the initiatives on the energy efficient devices, demand management has certainly gained some ground and momentum. Things are happening. Rooftop solars are becoming the order of the day. On the renewable, as I said, the program of 100,000 has been escalated now to 175 gigawatt. So it, it's being strengthened and a lot of efforts are going on in that direction. On the thermal power, an interesting situation has emerged. While coal supply, thanks to Coal India, has increased at 9%, which is again unprecedented. It has never happened in the past. 42 million tons of incremental coal were offered. But out of that, 17 to 18 million tons of coal have actually gone into stocks, uh, either at the power station end or at the pit heads. Power stations are all comfortable. There is no critical or supercritical power station anymore. And the average stock is perhaps around 22, 23 days or something around that. So, uh, I mean, they, they are actually resisting to take coal. It's that kind of a situation. At least the power stations which have a valid full supply agreement with Coal India, they are absolutely comfortable at this point in time. Now, 
this is despite the fact that the captive blocks were actually not didn't produce anywhere near the target respected Sri Shovandev Chattopadhyay, the Minister for Power and Renewables, Government of West Bengal has arrived. In fact, <laughs> last year also I remember we had the Diden Minister for Power in the, in, the, in the podium along with the Minister for Power in the Government of India and it is really great to have policy makers at this point in time. So coming back to what I was trying to say, that one year later what we find is Coal is abundantly available, despite the captive blocks producing less than half of what they are supposed to produce. And even Coal India reducing its production from the target because they were not finding place to sell coal. So under this kind of a situation, what would, what would people normally expect? We normally expect that the power stations with such, a, such amount of coal would be actually generated into full capacity. The PLF would be really very high and certainly better than the best that we have seen so far, which is about 75%. Unfortunately, that was not to be. What has happened is the PLF has further dropped. It has been dropping in the last few years, and now it has further dropped to 62% as compared to 64% in the immediately preceding year, that is 2014-15. Based on the capacity that we have for thermal power, each unit of PLF roughly corresponds to about 14 billion units of power which is equivalent to 9 million tons of coal. So if the power stations that we have today, the existing power stations, they, let us say with a magic wand, they go back to the PLF of 75%, we actually get 170 billion units of additional power at the marginal cost, which is only the coal cost, varying somewhere from 1 rupee 20 paisa to 1 rupee 70 paisa, depending upon the source and logistic costs. We are not getting that power. I am not sure for what good reason. This would also have amounted to an additional demand of 120 million tons of coal, which would, not, which would have made life simpler for Coal India to pursue its growth path for another 2-3 years. And a situation where the Coal India Director Marketing is now moving to the customer's doors to find out how, how he can sell his coal would not have arisen. Now this must have happened because of something very deep, I mean for which more insight is required. We all know that solar power is a power where the raw material cost is actually zero, but not available for the entire duration of the day, whereas coal based power, well there is a cost of mining coal, but where capacities have, are already with us and where you get power at the marginal cost not to have that power or foregoing that power for any reason to me is a little bit of a dilemma if I put it that way and it appears that affordability of power again we have another problem that discoms don't have money to pay or discoms don't cannot sell that power because of the price so that and not generating power from the thermal power stations to its peak capacity to my mind seems to be a little bit of a riddle. This is particularly so because in a country like India, our share in the global emission is just about 6% against a population share of 15%. This is completely in contrast to the Chinese situation where the share in uh, emission is much more than the share of population and China has to roll back its program. But China has pursued a coal-based development strategy for the last 50 years and it is consuming more than 3 billion tons of coal with a population which is just about 10% more than ours. So should we actually stop the process of coal-based development a little abruptly and move more fast to the solar power? Or should we have both? We create existing capacities mostly in solar. We don't add too, too much to the thermal power capacities, but use the existing capacities to its fullest. 
this is a question that I am quite sure many of you will be having and we would be very happy to have the perspective of our learned speakers on this issue. I think with that, I thank you all for being a patient listener. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bhattacharya. Uh, we had a curtain raiser on this year's, the theme of this year's conclave on the 1st of April uh, this year. And we were fortunate to have Dr. Rajay Mathur uh, address us at the curtain raiser on the talks at COP21 and what the outcomes were. We are fortunate that he is again with us uh, today. And we would now request Dr. Rajay Mathur, Director General of Terry, uh, who, had, who was one of the negotiators at Paris, to pick up the threads from where he left on 1st of April and take us through the journey in giving us a reality check on the outcomes of Paris Accord as far as India is concerned. Dr. Mathur, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dignitaries on the dais, participants. As Mr. Mukherjee mentioned, in April we had discussed what went on at Paris and as a result of that, what is it that we need to do now? At Paris, I think the world made three significant agreements. The first was that we moved away from a kind of agreement which said that country X, you have to reduce your carbon dioxide emissions by so many percent. Instead what we said was each country will say what it can do. Each country pledges its own action. This was important because if you look at India, we are a country where a very large number of people still don't have access to adequate uh, electricity and cooking fuels, where the quality of life is relatively poor and clearly a huge amount of energy input is needed in order to enhance the quality of life of people. So carbon emissions would increase. Consequently, the pledges that we made were that while the carbon emissions may increase, they will always be the, carbon, the efficiency of carbon use will always keep on increasing. In other words, GDP will increase, energy use will increase, carbon will increase, but for every extra rupee of GDP, the amount of carbon that we will emit will be less and less and less in the years ahead. On the other hand, countries which have reached, in a sense, levels of saturation of energy, and of carbon dioxide emissions have committed to reduce the absolute amount of carbon dioxide that they emit. So at Paris, countries agreed to pledge what they could do, what made sense to them. Because they made these pledges themselves, the chances are that they will achieve it. As happens with each of us, when we promise the chances are we do achieve that promise. When we added up all the pledges that had been made at Paris, they were not enough to make sure that the world remains a safe place. A safe place in a very shorthand kind of manner is one in which the temperature rise is not more than two degrees above the global pre-industrial mean. When you add up all the pledges, we would still have a world with just 2.7 degrees more than the global pre-industrial mean. It meant we had to do more. And therefore the second part of the Paris Agreement was that we said that each country will periodically make more ambitious pledges. Every five years or so, there will be a global stock taking. We will see where we are 
and based on that global stock taking countries will see what is it that they can do more and in this process of more ambitious pledges reach the global goal that the world wants the third part was that if this process has to be followed then how does the world know that for example india is doing what it has promised and there we brought in what is known as a transparency requirement that we will periodically every year every two years put out what is it that we have done what is it we have achieved what is the progress towards meeting the pledges that we have made so pledge pledge more and transparency these are the three pillars of the paris agreement let us come back to what is it that india has to do what is it that each one have to do our pledges were first that we will make sure that the carbon intensity of our economy that is the carbon dioxide emissions divided by gdp would be 33 to 35% less in 2030 than they were in 2005 second that at least 40% of the installed generation capacity will be non fossil fuels nuclear hydro but largely renewables there were others how much forestry we will add about adaptation and so on but i think it is important to focus on the fact that we will need to enhance energy efficiency so that the carbon intensity decreases that we will need to enhance the amount of renewables that we add into the grid and not only add into the grid but are able to use it because you and i will need electricity even when the sun stops shining at night when the wind stops blowing where do we get electricity from that's where things like the pumped storage which bengal through the puralia project has uh, initiated and i hope that you will do many more become the basis of having a lot more renewables into the grid than is possible similarly as far as demand is concerned we had spoken of what is happening in the lighting sector in the industrial sector in each of these we look at energy efficiency increasing over a period of time the last part is transparency we also need to say what is it that we can do what are we doing what have we achieved we therefore need platforms through which these kinds of informations can be shared as we move ahead it means that each one of us should one should be able to for example uh, put solar rooftops that we should be able to see what is it that we can do in our homes in our offices to reduce energy consumption there are many many opportunities and on behalf of terry it gives me great satisfaction that we move ahead with bcci in through a mou to see how we can work together to enhance each of these kinds of activities particularly in the renewable area in the state of west bengal we look forward to work ever closer with each one of you thank you very much thank you very much dr mathur for uh, showing us the way forward what each one of us could do and we really look forward to a fruitful association between bengal chamber and terry going forward um, we are indeed very fortunate to have the chairman of coal india limited mr shutirtha bhattacharya with us this morning we are grateful to you sir and we would now request you to please address us and tell us all the good things about coal because we cannot live without coal that is that is for sure thank you very much 
ऑनरेबल मिनिस्टर ऑफ पावर गवर्नमेंट ऑफ वेस्ट बंगाल श्री शोभन देव चट्टोपाध्याय जी एंड एक्सट्रीमली डिस्टिंग्विस्ड पर्सन्स द वेरी नॉलेजेबल पीपल हु आर ऑन द डैश distinguished delegates and the members of the audience friends ladies and gentlemen it is indeed wonderful to be here at this i could say a kind of flagship event of bcc and i one of the oldest bodies which had been propounding in an integrated manner the economic thoughts for india from kolkata the brief given was after the presentation that was done on exactly what is happening in the world and after talks of indcs arising out of paris conference how to talk of coal yesterday there was i was telling the distinguished member of the us consulate there is a major item in the from the us saying that does king coal go out so if you see the literature emerging literature or the emerging news literature which comes out there are many adversarial views on exploitation of the finite resources in the world there are different paths which many different countries are traversing and many times those views are considered to be a somewhat writing a very early epitaph for coal i won't like to be drawn into those issues because it will require a full fledged debate one of the very respected functionaries of the diden planning commission whose report is considered to be one of the very major keystones in india's coal strategy is also amongst the audience and i am sure we will be loving to hear exactly he is another's perspective on the kind of vision and the kind of energy mix that india will have i would like to 